Hi there ladies and gents, Jax the Hexer here with my first video in quite a while. Apologies for the delay, it's been a madhouse in my neck of the woods, but rather than make excuses, let's get right back into things. First things first, who won the contest? Well, first place goes to... Da -da -da, Frey, who is looking forward to... Really looking forward to Phoenix Guard Aeronaut. Perhaps a bit too much. Second place goes to Drakkar T, who likes Orson's dream for a reason that many of us are fans of Hex in general, in that it takes big advantage of the potential of a digital card game. So congratulations to the winners, I've sent you messages on the Hex forums, so once our Kickstarter packs have been distributed, I'll get your prizes to you. With that business out of the way, let's get on with the video. What are we looking at today? Mulligan strategy. Now, hear me out. I know and you know that many players know what a mulligan is. But the thing is, there is a lot more strategy involved in mulligans than people acknowledge, and often players that aren't great at evaluating mulligans will unknowingly lose games they might have otherwise had a chance in, simply because they either did or did not mulligan. And that's why we're going to delve into it a bit today. First things first, just to cover all our bases, what is a mulligan? Well, in a game of Hex, you'll draw an initial hand of 7 cards before the game begins. A mulligan is an option you are given to shuffle this opening hand back into your deck and draw a new hand of one fewer cards. You can repeat this process as many times as you like, drawing one fewer card each time, until you are satisfied with your hand. Once we know that, the question then becomes why do we mulligan? You might hear some players say because you don't have enough sources in your hand, or because you didn't have enough early action in your hand. However, there is one reason, and one reason only that we mulligan. We mulligan when we believe that the hand with one less card has a higher chance of winning the game than the current hand we hold. We mulligan to improve our odds of winning. Of course, we never know for certain what the new hand we are going to draw will contain, so how do we gauge whether or not mulliganing will improve our odds? Well, we can use statistics and experience to help guide us. Typically, you'll want to do a lot of deck testing before you take a deck into a tournament, as it'll help you figure out what statistics you might need to find out, and will give you the experience you need to mulligan well in the tournament. But let's look into it further. To start with the very basics of strategy, hands with 0 or 1 resource, or 6 or 7 resources, are often not good enough to keep. Also, hands without at least 1 or 2 cards to play in the first 3 turns are often too inactive for the competitive environment. These are definitely not hard and fast rules, as we'll see, but they're a good starting point. I'll just take a moment to point out that often players will consider their chance to draw early action when deck building, which is why most decks have the bulk of their cards within the 1-3 to three cost range. Now, there's another important point to consider when evaluating your option to mulligan or not, and that's whether or not you're playing first or second, as the person playing second gets to draw a card on their first turn, while the person playing first does not. Now, only a few decks ever want to be played second, as playing first allows you to develop your board and game earlier, and is often more important to winning than drawing the extra card. However, if you're winning games, then you're definitely going to play against opponents who get to go first, and in those circumstances where you're playing second and drawing a card on your first turn, that extra card can influence your decision. But we'll go over that when we look at specific examples. But generally, and I do mean very generally, being on the draw is more forgiving of not mulliganing a close hand, and there are some hands that you'd mulligan on the play, but you wouldn't mulligan on the draw. I must stress that I'm not advocating that you choose to play second in every game, but rather, when you are playing second, you should take that into account when evaluating opening hands. A final point to consider is the specific matchup that you're actually playing, and this is why deck testing is so important to the mulligan process. Certain cards and lines of play will do better or worse depending on the matchup, and knowing what those cards and strategies are will inform your mulligan decisions. Furthermore, in deck testing you'll likely have seen a circumstance where you kept a similar hand that you're debating now, and you'll know how the game panned out. I'm also going to throw out an equation now, which I'll include in the video summary. This equation is used to determine your odds of drawing a desired card in a defined number of card draws, which is important when using maths to help us work out before a tournament specific times we should mulligan or not. The formula is 1 minus n divided by x to the power of y. n is the number of cards remaining in our deck that aren't the cards we want, x is the total number of cards left in the deck, and y is the number of drawn cards we are considering. As an example of using this formula, let us say we are playing a particularly aggressive deck and we have a hand of 7 cards. 
Six of those cards are one to three cost troops, and the other is a resource. What are our odds of drawing a second resource by our second turn if we're on the play? Well, we'll say we're running 23 resources in total, so we have 22 left in the deck. Since we're on the draw, we'll draw two cards by the time we want to play our second resource. So we plug in the figures. 1 minus 31, which is 53, the number of cards left in the deck, minus the number of resources left in the deck, which is 22. Divided by 53, which is the total number of cards left in the deck, to the power of 2, which is the number of drawn cards we're interested in, equals 0.66, or 66%. What that means is that if we kept the theoretical hand, in 13 games out of 20, we'd hit our second resource on turn 2, and be off to the races. Whether or not that's good enough depends largely on the rest of the cards in the hand and the specific matchup, but the odds do help us work out if the hand is good enough to keep or not. I must give credit to Patrick Chapin, who put this formula in his book Next Level Magic, and Craig Wesco, who posted it in an article about mulligans. I'll put a link in the video description. I don't believe the formula is technically correct, as drawing specific cards from a deck is a hypergeometric distribution, but I do know that it is close enough and far simpler to compute. But if you do want to use the correct formula, I'll also put that link in the description. Now, all the maths and theory in the world mean nothing unless we can use some examples to really help illuminate the information. So let's look at some. Let's start with something relatively simple. I am playing a mono ruby short range aggro deck against a wild diamond mid range aggro deck. In this matchup, I know I need to win as fast as possible before my opponent can gain superior board position through their bigger troops. I have the following 7 card hand, and I'm on the play. Ruby Shard, Ruby Shard, Ruby Shard, Inferno, Veteran Gladiator, Rocket Ranger, Ragefire. I have 16 troops in the deck that cost either 1 or 2 mana. Do I keep or mulligan? Well, our starting hand certainly doesn't give the impression that it's aggressive enough. Are our odds of drawing into a 1 or 2 drop troop on turn 2 good enough? Not even close, with a 70% chance that we won't. If we then look at our odds for a new 6 card hand, we have an 86% chance of getting at least 1, 1 or 2 cost troop, and just over a 50% chance of getting 2, as well as a 72% chance of getting 2 or more resources in that new hand if we are running a 22 resource deck. It seems fairly clear, if we want an aggressive start, we should mulligan that hand. For our next example, we are playing a Blood Sapphire control deck against a Mono Ruby short range aggro deck. In this matchup, I know that successfully getting off an extinction will go a long way towards winning me the game, and that Buccaneer is a really useful card, messing up the opponent's tempo and giving me a blocker that can trade with one of their troops. I am on the play and have the following 7 card hand. Blood Source, Blood Source, Sapphire Source, Sapphire Source, Sapphire Source, Buccaneer and Extinction. Do I keep or mulligan? With this example, we don't even need to look at the maths. While we have one or two more resources than we'd like, we have two of the key cards in this matchup, and those cards alone could go a long way to winning the game. In addition, being on the play means I'll get to play my Buccaneer and Extinction earlier, which means I won't be facing as much pressure as if I were on the draw. While deck testing will prove if these cards alone are good enough to carry the resource heavy hand, which just goes to show how important deck testing is in regards to mulligan strategy, without having the opportunity to deck test, this certainly seems like an easy keep to me. In our final example, we are playing a Wild Diamond mid-range aggro deck against a Mono Sapphire Flyers deck. In this matchup, I know I need to put forward strong early pressure on the ground to counteract the Flyers going over the top of my troops. I'm on the draw, and I have the following 6 card hand after having mulliganed once already. Wild Shard, Runir Commander, Succulent Roostasaur, Wild Root Dancer, Living Totem, in a conflict. Do we keep, or do we mulligan down to 5? This is a really tough one. It's a very good hand, and with just a second resource, it becomes one of the better starts for the deck. However, if you have 24 resources left in the deck, you have only a 45% chance of actually hitting your second resource drop, and while you could potentially recover from missing that one, you still only have a 70% chance of getting that resource by turn 3. It's a risk, especially when you consider that if you mulligan, those 5 cards plus your turn 2 draw have over an 80% chance of containing 2 resources. I gave this example for two reasons. Firstly, many players are very hesitant to go down to 5 cards, even when it could be the better option. Now, it's not necessarily the best option here, but many players wouldn't even consider getting rid of this hand, even though it has only one shard and only a 70% chance of hitting the second resource drop by turn 3, which will already be delayed if it does hit then. Secondly, it highlights how your decision can change between being on the play and being on the draw. 
This is a much easier hand to keep on the draw, as the extra draw step increases your odds of hitting your second resource, which is the most important criteria for this hand. Personally, I would hope that I had deck tested this enough to know how potent this hand is, and importantly, how Rune E Commander would do on his own if he didn't get any backup until turn 4 or 5. However, given that he trades with any one power troop, and that mana screw early in a competitive game can be deadly, I'd definitely be leaning towards mulliganing. I too hate going down to 5, but sometimes discretion is the better part of Valor. If I were on the draw though, I'd likely keep. To sum up some of the key points of Mulligan strategy, consider how many shards and non-shards you have in your hand, if you have at least one or two early plays, if you're on the play or draw, and what cards you've learned are important in your matchups. But perhaps most importantly, pay attention to detail when deck testing, and let that experience guide you when facing down tough Mulligan decisions. If you're unsure about any potential scenarios you might face, do the maths beforehand, and keep the formula on hand when you're actually playing matches. It's worth eating up two minutes of your clock and making the right call, then guesstimating and getting it wrong. But that, ladies and gentlemen, has been a rather decent look at Mulligan's strategy. I hope you've taken something away from it, and it will help you be a better player when we finally get to play that wonderful game, Hex. But in any case, as always, remember, keep being exceptional. <laughs>